Chapter 19. Why were the Jews destroyed? In the collection of verses that we have quoted below, we can see why God brought judgment upon the Jewish nation in AD 70. It was prophesied throughout the Old Testament and fulfilled in the first century when Christ came to save his people and destroy his enemies. The first section of the text is from the Old Testament, specifically Deuteronomy, where Moses warned the Israelites what would befall them in the latter days, when they broke the covenant. The second section of quotes is from the New Testament, showing that Moses' predictions were precisely fulfilled in the coming of Christ and the establishment of his eternal kingdom. And Moses summoned all Israel and said unto them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, and all his servants, and all his land. If your heart turns away, and you will not obey, I declare unto you today that you shall surely perish. For I know that after my death you will act corruptly and turn from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days. They have acted corruptly towards him. They are not his children because of their defect, but are a perverse and crooked generation. And the Lord saw this and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and daughters. Then he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a perverse generation, sons in whom there is no faithfulness. They have made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. Rejoice, O nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance on his adversaries and will atone for his land and his people. There is none like the God of Jeshurun, who rides the heavens to your help and through the skies in his majesty. The eternal God is a dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he drove out the enemies from before you and said, Destroy. Deuteronomy 29, 2, 30, 17 to 18, 31, 29, 32, 5, 19, 21, 43, 33, 26 to 27. Even so you, too, when you see all these things, recognise that he is nigh, right at the door. Truly I say unto you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jews first and also of the Gentiles. But glory and honour and peace to every man who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heavens and things upon earth. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Matthew 24, 33, 34, Acts 2, 39 to 40, Romans 2, 9 to 10, Ephesians 1, 3 to 10, Romans 8, 35, 37. The unbelieving Jews were cut off from their inheritance and destroyed while the faithful remnant of believing Jews, along with believing Gentiles, inherited those covenantal blessings, Romans 9 to 11, especially 11, 17 to 24. Thus, the establishment of the eternal kingdom of Christ at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD was the fulfilment of all those things that were promised to God's chosen people, the true spiritual Israel, which included both believing Jews and believing Gentiles. Romans 2, 28 to 29, 9, 6 to 8, 
9, 22 to 24, and 11, 5 to 7. Chapter 20. What about modern Israel? The mere mention of that destruction in AD 70 raises legitimate concerns among Jewish people. The author wishes to reassure the Jewish people that he does not cast guilt upon the modern Jews for what some of the first century ancestors might have done. The author has no anti-Semitic bias against the Jewish people at all, but rather a fond appreciation for the rich heritage that they have given all mankind, especially to Christians, and a sympathetic understanding of the unspeakable anguish they have suffered throughout history. The world has much to learn from their history and religion, and much to thank them for. The Apostle Paul stated that Israel was beloved for the sake of the fathers, for our faith and enemies, only because of their rejection of the gospel and persecution of Christians. It was the Jews who were entrusted with the oracles of God, as Jesus said, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings forth out of his treasure things new and old. Matthew 13 verse 52. And it was through them that the Gentile world has received redemption, for salvation is from the Jews. John 4 22. But it needs to be clearly stated that fleshly, racial, ethnic, nationalistic Israel does not have a guaranteed place in the spiritual kingdom of Christ, regardless of whether they are fleshly descendants of Abraham or keepers of the Mosaic law. The physical temple, priesthood and sacrifices were merely types and symbols of the spiritual realities we have in Christ. A righteous remnant of faithful Jewish believers in Messiah Jesus were grafted back into God's olive tree, along with the Gentile believers, in order to fill up the one olive tree, all Israel, Romans 11, 17 to 24, John 10, 16. Messiah Jesus has consummated all things in himself and the true spiritual Israel, the church, the kingdom. The modern physical land of Israel is not the true spiritual promised land, nor are the modern fleshly descendants of Abraham the true chosen people. Those promises are fulfilled in Christ and his spiritual kingdom, the better heavenly things. Hebrews 9, 23, 11, 16, 12, 22 to 28, which all Christians now enjoy. Believers in Christ are citizens of the heavenly country and have a better spiritual temple, priesthood and sacrifices. The physical sacrifices, priesthood and temple were destined to disappear or vanish away when the true spiritual antitype arrived. Hebrews 7, 12 to 18, 8, 13, 9, 8 to 10, 2 Corinthians 3, 7 to 13, Mark 2, 2, 21, Colossians 2, 8 to 23. Many futurists, especially premillennial dispensationalists, believe that Christ failed in his mission to set up an earthly kingdom and that he will have to come back, restore the old physical temple, priesthood and sacrifices and try again. The prophecies about the establishment of the kingdom were supposed to be fulfilled during a time when the temple and sacrifices were in operation and since they believe the kingdom is not yet here, they think the temple will have to be rebuilt and the sacrifice is reinstated. That would make Christ's priestly and sacrificial work on the cross meaningless and powerless. Chapter 21. How does this shape our world view? The futurist views of prophecy, popularised by Schofield, Wolverdord, Lindsay, Al Lahale, Tom Ice, Grant Jeffrey, Van Imp and others, have caused tremendous confusion. The constant false predictions of the date setters has disillusioned many and provided ammunition for the critics of Christianity. Every generation thinks it's the final generation. The worldly divergent views of Bible prophecy has not only confused Christians, but has disillusioned many to the point of leaving the faith altogether, and in some cases, even suicide. Back in 1988, to 1994, some women in Korea who thought the rapture was going to occur before their babies were born had abortions. The worldview which comes out of that kind of futurism is defeatism, retreatism, escapists and pessimistic. 
It thinks things are just about over, so it has no constant reason for improving conditions of society for the long term. It is not interested in polishing brass on the sinking ship. It actually believes that things will get worse before the end of the world, so they refrain from doing anything to make it better. Only the preacher's view provides the correct, optimistic, long-term worldview to empower Christians to keep on expanding Christ's kingdom and making a big difference in the world, in all generations of the future. Chapter 22. What about us today? An AD 70 fulfilment of eschatology raises several questions, such as, where do we go from here if all prophecy is fulfilled? What is left for us today? How does the preterist view change the way we are supposed to live as Christians on this earth? The resurrection and judgment at AD 70 were once for all events, just like the cross and Christ's resurrection. They are never to be repeated, and like the cross, they have ongoing benefits and implications for all Christians throughout the rest of eternity. David Chilton often emphasised this point by emphasised this point by closing his emails with the quotation from Isaiah, Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. There will be no end to the increase of his government or peace in the th on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with the justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, italics added. What kind of kingdom, government and peace was Isaiah pointing to? Was it the same kind of kingdom Jesus had in mind when he said, My kingdom is not of this world or realm? John 18.36 both Ezekiel 47 and Revelation 21 to 22 describe the nature of that ongoing kingdom. It is like a pure river, a river of pure water coming from the threshold of the new spiritual temple, the church, that Christ built in the last days, which gets deeper and wider and further it travels onwards from Jerusalem. It continues to grow and increase its impact upon all cultures of the world. Christ has said, that it is like leaven, or like a mustard seed. It starts out small and almost imperceptible, but eventually grows into an inescapable and irresistible culture and spiritual force. And on the banks of this river of life are luxurious trees with leaves that provide shelter and healing to all nations. All nations walk by its glory and bring their glory to it and are healed by it. This shows the victorious conquest of the kingdom over all culture and nations, giving glory to God throughout all generations of the ages of ages. Ephesians 3.21 This is an ongoing growth of our spiritual dominion in the new creation. Some of Jesus' parables talks about the small beginnings of the kingdom and its potential growth afterwards. It is extremely significant that church history right from AD 70 reveals the same small beginnings of the eternal kingdom that we see in Ezekiel 47. Many church historians note the silence and inactivity of and obscurity of the church for about two decades after the destruction of Jerusalem. This shows that the kingdom indeed started out as a very small trickle of living water, almost imperceptible at first, but which continues to grow into a mighty river that can purify the culture. When we see how far Christianity has progressed since its beginnings in the first century, who is not amazed at its growth? No culture has been able to resist its influence after the gospel has gone there. Already the Bible has been translated into all major languages and most dialects. There are Christian missionaries in every nation on the earth. All nations will ultimately be changed by its transforming power the same way the Western Hemisphere has been. However, it will never convert every person in every culture, just as not every person in America was converted. But it does mean that every culture will be impacted by Christianity, at least as much as America has been. And Christ is here to live in us and through us forever, to enable us to be his ambassadors, to have that kind of spiritual influence and dominion for his glory. 
All the moral, ethical and spiritual principles revealed in the Bible will continue to apply to each succeeding generation of human history. Human nature has not changed, nor will it ever change. Therefore, the Bible principles which govern our lives never need to be changed. The Bible is the book for all of human history, both now and for all ages to come. Since humanity will continue to exist for all generations of the ages of ages, our children and their descendants will continue to live in this universe for the eternal future. That means we need to take care of this planet and its resources and teach our children to have dominion over it and be faithful caretakers of it. In short, the preterist view is the only prophetic view which faithfully interprets the past, teaches us how to live righteously in the present and equips all future generations for fruitful and productive life somewhere in this infinite universe.